You're listening to the UBC Medicine Learning Network. Yeah, hi, my name is Joe Finkler. I'm an emergency physician at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver, also a clinical associate professor uh, in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia, which means I get to lecture the odd time and have a tutorial group uh, every year. Welcome, Dr. Finkler. Thank you for joining us at Metamorphosis. My name is Tina. And my name is Faison, and here on Metamorphosis, we're going to be interviewing various physicians across BC with the aim of learning more about their specialties and helping us navigate our medical careers. So Dr. Finkler, I doubt that you'll remember this, but uh, actually you were one of the first preceptors I had in uh, one of the introductory weeks of UBC Medicine. It was one of the small group sessions. Um, but for a lot of people who don't know who you are, could you tell us a little bit more about your background and your path to medicine? My path to medicine and my background, probably the most uh, circuitous uh, path into medicine. It took me a long time to get into uh, medical school, probably because I I didn't have the uh, threshold grades to get in. In fact, in looking back, I probably had an anxiety disorder on examinations and couldn't perform as well as I I, I may have had the potential to do based on studying and maybe natural intelligence, which is not that high. But anyhow, um, I, I think I could have wallpapered my room with the rejection letters that I got from all the schools, but luckily somebody made a mistake at McMaster University back in um, uh, 1986, and I went to medical school there. If I had to go back tomorrow, if you said uh, taking away all, all all your material possessions, everything you have, you have to go back to medical school as uh, the young man you were back then, I, I would do it in a flash. I loved it. I think the thing I like the most about it back in the day is the diversity of the students. It was so much fun to sit down in the rare lectures or, or group um, gatherings that we had, and everybody I sat down beside was so, came from a different background, was funny, interesting, uh, yeah, diverse. It was just, it was so, it was so much fun from that perspective. I guess I sort of felt like I was sort of sitting in a land of giants. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all feel that way sometimes. You know, as medical students, the whole imposter syndrome is something definitely that I experience. I want to know more about how you got into medicine. Um, how, what was your journey? You said that it, it took a lot of rejection letters. How did you know that you wanted to do medicine in the first place? What? Drew oh, you yeah, that? that's a great question. You know, I think that, um, uh, you know, my uh, my impression or understanding of medicine is probably on the level of television, you know, based on shows that you've probably never seen like Marcus Welby or <laughs> television like 20, 30 years ago. Uh, um, I did have um, a relative, an uncle who did medical school, but he, he died suddenly when I was, I think, around age seven. So I, I probably never had a good understanding of uh, what it meant to be a medical doctor Obviously, as a kid, I went to a doctor a few times, um, but probably the thing that motivated me the most is, one, is I really liked people. Uh, that was consistent, and I did like the biology, and I did do well in that, and I had a group of, of uh, colleagues in high school who had similar sort of aspirations, so I sort of, I guess, followed, maybe not in their footsteps, more like their exhaust, and, uh, you know, slower to get in, so that that was really the uh, the interest in in uh, in uh, in uh, people and the interest in uh, in biology and human biology, in particular. So you know, I went to Queen's University and did an undergraduate in life sciences, and then didn't get into medical school and then apl applied to graduate school and did a graduate degree in um, physiology with an interest in res cardiorespiratory physiology. Um, still couldn't get into medical school, so I worked for a year as a research assistant. Uh, in the Department of Anesthesia, doing uh, respiratory research, um, did a little bit of teaching, um, and just sort of hanging out. And then I um, had a good buddy who had a similar sort of trajectory as mine, a very bright, uh, gregarious guy, solid, uh, but just couldn't, uh, for whatever reason, also hit the threshold marks to get into uh, the major medical schools. And he went off to St. Andrews Medical School in Scotland, and uh, one day when I was working at home one evening, uh, he phones me and says, Joe, you've got to come here. Just apply. I'm sure you'll get in. And and so I took a loan out and applied to medical school and went to St. Andrews. 
which is uh, by the North Sea in Scotland, and uh, I'd never been to Scotland before. And, you know, there I was renting a room over the North Sea and studying anatomy and physiology with the uh, undergraduate uh, students in Scotland. And so I did a year of that, which was both um, a blessing, a blessing and a curse. A curse in that the uh, it was so detailed and boring. Basically, people were reading Gray's Anatomy to you during the anatomy class. Like I, after a while, I just couldn't go. I was just breaking too many pencils just listening to that. So I stayed home and studied. But the exams were hugely detailed. People would ask you on an exam, uh, you know, for. For 10 marks, uh, what is the course of the radial nerve from its roots in the spinal cord to its termination in the fingertips? Oh, boy. No, so this was the level of C5 detail. C5 to D1. Yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, tell you. luckily there were a lot of pubs in St. Andrews. Um, the students were a lot younger than me. But I just boned down and did the work. Uh, I, I can't say that I excelled but did reasonable I think I was like a B, B plus, but I certainly wasn't A plus uh, on the exam. Say, um, you if you didn't know the answer and you didn't put any mark down, you got zero. If you put an answer down, it was the wrong answer. You got negative. So it was negatives. It was wrongs from rights. So you could get eighty percent on an exam, but actually get a mark of sixty because you guessed on ten or twenty. So it was crazy. Anyways, luckily, I still submitted a medic, another application to McMaster, got a second interview, and then got into medical school at McMaster and said goodbye to Scotland and the frozen North Sea. And um, there I embarked on my undergraduate program at McMaster, which was just a riot. It was a lot of fun. It was great. Sounds like you really enjoyed it. Do you think this kind of untraditional path to medical school helped you in your career as a doctor? Ah, uh, gosh, I don't know. You know, I think if I would have gone back, would have helped me, I would have gone back and done a fine arts degree um, or liberal arts degree uh, so that um, you're exposed to quadrants outside of medicine. So much of what I'd done is biological sciences, but I mean, the only history I knew is that uh, First Nations arrived on this continent in canoes, or and the Egyptians made pyramids, and I don't know, they fought a lot of wars, and I don't really know why. And so I didn't really know very much about history. I didn't know about English literature, poetry. I didn't know about philosophy, how to reason. Uh, I didn't know anything about economics. Um, yeah, and so medicine is so much about people, and... Uh, and when you are talking to people and people come from such diverse backgrounds, it, it sort of makes sense that you understand that and understand, you know, where what, where are we on this planet and how did we arrive here? And I think that those those fine arts or liberal arts degree would have really sort of served me well, would have given me a different lens. I, I had the, the scientific lens, which is only one slice of the pie of medicine, and it might be the, probably the smallest slice. You know, there's many other domains. You know, we're working with people. You're working within a political environment, ecological environment, that sort of thing. So anyways, I, I probably wish I'd had that. But, um, no, I think the good time at McMaster was probably the program. It was just unstructured, which sort of served my, uh, what's the word, almost freestyle, free-floating style. You know, I'm the type of guy that would, jump out of the plane, then just figure out, geez, did I pack my parachute? I, I hope I packed it. Uh, so it sort of fit my style, and I love my classmates. There was lots of freedom and flexibility, and we were sort of well-supported by, by faculty, and it was a really upbeat atmosphere. So you kind of touched on medical education, and uh, you mentioned that you're also a clinical associate? Yeah, professor. Professor. Uh, Which UBC. means nothing. Like, I don't even get a discount at the pool. <laughs> okay, so it right. doesn't mean as we. <laughs> um, I recall you gave us um, a bunch of lectures uh, in first year on hypertension. And I vividly remember you being one of the professors that was very engaged into the class. Um, I remember you bringing props yeah. to, to the lecture. And so that was something that was really memorable for us. Um, how do you think medical education can be changed for the better? You mentioned a lot about your pathway and how... It was a little bit non-traditional that medicine's about people. 
Um, is there anything you think that can be changed in today's medical education? Yeah, I think I, what it suffers from is death by PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was an article, I think it was two years ago, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it says, is it time to kill the lecture? It probably is. I, I think people put up, in, in good spirit, we all put up, you know, what we think students need to know, like if I'm an expert on ovarian cancer, I think you should know these 25 points and all these markers and natural progression. But really, people can only take a couple of messages away from a lecture. So then then if that's all they can take away, and that's what the science tells us for adult learning, that people have an attention span that's much less than the 50 minutes that you're allotted for a lecture, and they can retain only a couple of points. And, and really... Why are you putting all these points up there, and and what what do you, and what's the retention factor? And I know the retention factor is really low because I get to see medical students when they're clinical clerks on the ward, and I can ask just about every student the same question. The question I ask them is, I have a patient here with a low sodium, and I say, well, what is your approach to low sodium? And the, the universal answer is the following: they either have too little salt or too much water. And it's way more complicated than that. Hyponatremia has an algorithm that's quite a bit different than that. And I know they had a slide on that, probably 10 or 20 PowerPoint slides on that during the fluid and electrolytes or, or whatever it's called, nephrology unit. And they would have had that in the cardiovascular to some extent. And it, it doesn't reflect on the fact that they're stupid people. They're not stupid people. It's just... I think it was lost learning. And I'm going to get to have a chance to do this in a few weeks. I've been off because of, I'm recovering from my knee replacement surgery. But I, I asked the same question to the last group, and it's a 100% hit rate. It's the same answer. And it's because, it's, I think it's just because it's hard to learn in, in that environment. So I, I think we ought to change that uh, and make it more uh, interactive and engaging and to the point and let the students fill in the details because the details will change. You know, they always say that 50% um, um, uh, of what uh, you're going to learn in medical school is uh, uh, wrong and the other 50% is bullshit, you know? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, so just shifting gears a little bit, I sure. want to know more about... Um, how you chose uh, your specialty. You mentioned that you're an ER physician at St. Paul's. Yeah, that's just as circuitous as my crazy life story. Um, anyhow, I um, at McMaster, our mentors were in the program, the more prominent people, our teachers, our leaders, were people from internal medicine and family medicine, and with the rare exception, general surgery. The other people sort of looked at the program and squinted. They say, well, we'll tolerate those people, but I don't know how, why they're learning in this fashion, the small group learning way and little modules and all that sort of stuff. So um, when I finished, uh, when I was in uh, my clerkship years or my clinical years, the mentors were internal medicine, and I, I, I quite liked that. I thought that was really, you know, really cool inter intellectual masturbation. And so I, I quite liked that. And our... our, our uh, some of our teachers were big names in internal medicine, like David Sackett, who was the grandfather of evidence-based medicine, and Gordon Guyatt, who was his protege and also is a huge name in evidence-based medicine. So a lot of these people uh, were there, um, and, and Brian Haynes is another one. And so these were our preceptors or, or on the clinical thing. So I asked that, geez, I want to be like them. So I more wanted to be like the person than maybe the subject matter. So when I finished, and I did, so I did electives in internal medicine. I did a few other electives. And the thing about um, anything in life is you don't know what you don't know because you haven't been exposed to it. The same is true in medicine. So I hadn't been exposed to many other things. I had not been exposed to ophthalmology, uh, plastic surgery, um, pediatric surgery, intensive care, um, I did get exposed to general surgery, but it was towards the end of my rotation. But anyhow, so I chose internal medicine, and I chose it at Toronto at a smaller hospital, Mount Sinai Hospital, because I was intimidated uh, by the people at U of T, because those were the people that knew, like, the, 
the textbook. Like they had the Manhattan telephone directory of facts, and I had like a little f- flashcard <laughs> of facts. And, and so I thought, uh, I mean, I'll go to a smaller hospital, I'll do internal medicine. And it turned out, actually, I didn't really enjoy internal medicine at all. I, I liked the thought process, but I just felt that uh, it, it just wasn't for me. Um, yeah, the practice of internal medicine just seemed to me it wasn't it wasn't fast paced enough and I used to get to look out the window and watch the helicopter land at Sick Kids Hospital and I was thinking, well maybe, maybe there's some hope landing there and I, I'm with old people that are uh that are almost certainly gonna die of the disease at there in hospital. Not all of them. And I don't want to be too cynical, but I don't know, I just seem that seemed like hope over there and seemed like to me some extent hopelessness over here. We were doing the same thing, the same patients were admitted, discharged admitted discharge and I don't know it might have been my frame of mind um but in any case uh I, I didn't enjoy that um so I had a friend who was in high a high school friend who was in a small town and said just come and join me in my small town we'll practice uh general medicine together and so actually I did I went to a small town in uh northeast of Tor- Toronto near Peterborough and I'd never actually lived in a small town which was crazy why did I I must have been nuts, and I never did, knew anything about general practice. And the first day of my uh, my first rot- uh, first day of clinical practice, when I held my clinic, the patients were lined out the door till 9 p.m. because I was doing an internal medicine examination on every one of them from head to toe. You know, <laughs> by the time I finished, I decided to leave there for for many other reasons. But when I decided to leave, I, there was no lineup out the door. And I was out on time. Um, so I, I didn't like general practice, not so much because I didn't like the variety of the people. I, I felt really isolated in my work. And still the acuity wasn't much. And yet I went did home visits to people in my car and my dog plowing through the snow to see people with exacerbations of COPD or had strokes in their homes. Ran clinics on the weekend, did shifts and emerge. And I still... Didn't find the acuity was high enough for me. Um, and then we had a ski vacation in British Columbia. And my wife and I said, geez, it's so pretty out here. We should just move here. So I told my buddy, I think I'm not going to continue in practice. He went through the roof. <laughs> Packed our car. We drove out to British Columbia. Ended up here. And the college here said, um, uh, we won't give you a license. You your license in Ontario is invalid here. You haven't done general surgery or pediatrics. And I said, well, that's okay. I'll just, uh, I'll hang out with a, uh, or anyway, so you haven't done general surgery or obstetrics. And I said, well, that's okay. I'll hang out with an obstetrician for six weeks or eight weeks, however long it takes for free. And then I'll hang out with a, a general surgeon. I said, well, you, you can't do that. The professional associations or residents won't let you work for free. So you can't, you can't get a license here. And they said, so what if I, I joined a residency training program? They said, okay, if you join a residency training program and you could fulfill your requirements to do both general surgery and obstetrics and gynecology, we might grant you a license. And so someone dropped out of an obstetrics and gynecology program, and, and I said, I'm in. <laughs> what was the time difference between finishing your original residency and coming so to So I did a year of ge- internal medicine, a year of general practice, and then decided to come out. Uh, somebody dropped out of a obstetrics and gynecology program, and I said, I'll join that program as a second-year resident. <laughs> Not that I knew anything about obstetrics and gynecology. I don't even think I delivered a baby. But anyhow, it was a phenomenal experience. I did um, six months of obstetrics at uh, the Grace Hospital, and then I went back to the college, and they said, well, that's great. You have your obstetrics and gynecology, but you don't have your general surgery. And I said, how much do I need? He says, six weeks. I said, great, I have six weeks of vacation. (laughs) So I did six weeks of pediatric and adult general surgery and had a riot. And after that, I thought, you know, I, I think I could be a general surgeon, but anyways... I was in obstetrics. So what what got hooked me into emergency medicine? So I was at St. Paul's Hospital, and uh, we did a lot of consults to emergency for gynecology. And every time I came down there, 
it was sort of like a carnival, and these seemed to be the happiest guys in the hospital having the most fun, like resuscitating patients and uh, interesting, challenging cases. And so I said to them, geez, I wonder, could I, could I join this program? It was a family practice emerge program. They said, well, I don't know. I don't know. Have you done family practice? I said, well, I did a year. He says, well, you didn't do the residency. I said, but I've done two years of postgraduate training. He says, well, let's find out and submit an application. And so I did. And when I joined the program, they said, well, you haven't done the family practice exam, so you can't technically become a family practice resident in the emergency program. And so I went to write a practice exam, and I did terrible. They said, oh, your, your family practice skills are horrible. We better tune you up. In addition to doing this, but you can still join the emergency program, but you'll have to go to a family practice office once a week <laughs> on top of all your other stuff. And I said, okay, I'll go to a family practice. And so I went to a lovely guy who's still around. He's probably 90. And I went to, at the, after I did my emergency shifts, I'd spend a day in his family practice. Did you get your stamps every week? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and after, it was Dr. Peter Grantham, a lovely guy, and a a wise old physician, a dying breed for sure. It was right where the alumni center is, the MSEC is behind there. It's no longer there, the building. I think it's, uh, I don't know what it is, but it was right behind there. It was called Fair, Fairmont Family Practice. And Peter put his arm around me one day and says, Joe, you can stop coming. Oh. <laughs> so I wrote the family practice exam. I passed the exam, finished my emergency residency, wrote that exam. And there I was. So it was really a circuitous route, and I think it uh, touched on the thing. As I didn't really know very much about emergency medicine, I liked it as a as a rotation that I did. Um, I did electives in emergency medicine as a medical student, quite like that. I, I did a rotation as part of my internal medicine in emergency medicine. I liked that, but I wasn't sure that was the thing for me. The the thing I wasn't sure was what was for me actually. I I really wasn't sure. I, I seem to sort of like everything. I can't see I hated anything. Uh, yeah, really, I, there wasn't anything I disliked. I thought dermatology was a little boring, but I thought maybe you could make up by that by looking at vacation guides or or car magazines or something because I make so much money. But it it wasn't my thing just looking at skin. But so that was my route, you know, and. It was sort of unconventional and sort of the wrong side of the mountain, I guess. I think a lot of us are in the same boat, and that's actually mm -hmm. the reason for this entire podcast, um, the kind of undifferentiated, not knowing medical student. So do you have advice for someone um, like us or like you previously who doesn't really know a lot about the other fields and doesn't know exactly what they want? Sure. What would be my advice? So... Uh, people look at um, the specialties. Some people have to do a specialty because it makes a lot of money. Like plastic, I have to be a plastic surgeon because I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get that glamorous guy or that glamorous gal or, or that glamorous I don't know what, and I have to have the fancy car and, you know, live in Shaughnessy or Yorkville. It's so I need that. that so some people are, are are looking at jobs for lifestyle. I I hear this lifestyle stuff on and on again, and I I, I think it's a load of crap. Um, the other thing is people choose specialty yeah, based on lifestyle, income, uh, glamour, stature. I, I don't know. I, I think also the silent thing is people uh, choose a specialty based on the mentors. This is what I found is I could find happy people in every aspect of medicine, from family medicine to ENT to ophthalmology, the happiest people on the planet and then I can find you the most miserable people in all those specialties and so I think actually what people are actually doing is trying to mirror or mimic their mentors which is maybe a good thing actually because I think what you want to if I had to do it again I, I want to be the doc like that doc that doctor that he or she is a kind nice person and that uh, that's that's sort of where I am feel I'm ending up now. I want to be like some of those great doctors that were my mentors, that I would take my child to them if they were deathly ill, my mother to them if I was sick, or I would go to them if I'm making knee. 
And so it's sort of about, I think it's all about that. Uh, the other thing is people say, well, uh, there's no jobs in this specialty. Like, there's no jobs in orthopedics, and I really like orthopedics. I love it. It is my thing, but there's no jobs. And I would say you don't know how things might change in the future. Like, look at this world, how in a few weeks, like, it's turned upside down with elections and nominations and catastrophes. So you don't know what the future might be in medicine and how people might be financially compensated or how they amount amalgamate into health regions. So I would say I would always choose this field of, spe of specialty or the specialty that you want based on what you want to do, not on what to think the future hold because I think you're you're sort of betting on a like on a stock market that with many variables that will that will change. And I just know that it almost works out for everybody. If everybody usually gets what they want. Maybe not the first crack yet. Yeah, maybe you won't get cardiology in Vancouver on the first crack. So maybe you'll do cardiology in Saskatchewan. Would that be so terrible? Maybe they're nice people in Saskatchewan. <laughs> maybe they're lovely patients. Maybe you'll have more to, to do and more free run. Maybe you'll get better skills. Maybe they'll be lovely mentors. I don't know. And maybe someone will retire in Vancouver and you'll just float right in, shoe right in. I don't know. They told me I wouldn't get, get into medical school. They told me I wouldn't get a license in BC. They told me I couldn't get into emergency medicine. When I got out, I, I said, geez, I wonder if I could join this group at St. Paul. I said, we would never hire you. Like, you can't bring anything to this group. I got a job at St. Paul's. So what is it? And I'm there longer than all those people, most of those people that told me that I would never have a job. So so what is it? Like, I, I think I think most of it is your philosophy. I really think it's this Buddhist, Zen, yoga, whatever it is. I think it's the philosophy. And it can be a miserable life in family practice or a joyous life. And I think you get to choose. And it can be a miserable life in pediatric general surgery or a joyous life. And you get to choose. And I think that all aspects of medicine have, have, have great joy and reward. And I think you just have to choose. If I could do it again, I might have done some things different. I'm okay where I am. I'm happy where I am. What would you have done differently? You know, I just didn't know. Like, there were so many things I wasn't exposed to. Like, in uh, in uh, emergency medicine, we did a rotation in plastic surgery. So I just all assumed it was lips and, bo and breasts, you know, that they were augmentation. But actually, plastic surgery is actually, the hand is actually quite complicated and interesting. And so is the face in terms of trauma and reconstruction of facial bones. So that was quite interesting. The other thing that was super fascinating to me was we did a rotation that they don't do anymore is pediatric ICU. And that was super fascinating to me. That was really high, high-end physiology. And there were some really clever people, and they're still there. And I thought, geez, I would love to be like those people. But nevertheless, I'm in a emergency medicine, and, and it's okay. It's okay. Um, you know, I think that with time, maybe it's just me growing old or my getting weary, but um, uh, there's an analogy, this uh, famous, uh, well, maybe not a famous poet, but uh, maybe a well, uh, uh, an unknown and uh, a lovely poet named um, Hayden Carruth wrote. He talks about life as um, an hourglass. And at the, top, at the beginning of time when you turn the hourglass, all the sand is in the top portion. And that's the ego. And as the ego fades away, you, you, the sand flows into the bottom part. And he calls the bottom part almost entirely love. And so he writes this poem uh, to his wife. It's not, not re I don't even know if he's calling it an obituary, eulogy, um, but he's just leaving a message to his wife. And he says, as the ego of the upper chamber fades, I move into the lower chamber and I'm almost, almost entirely loved. So I have just a lot of gratitude and I'm happy. I'm happy to be working where I am. I love the nurses. The patients are difficult, but I'm not frustrated with them. I'm not angry with them. I'm not fighting with them. I'm not fighting with myself. I'm just happy that I can go to work and have a job and I have a skill and sometimes I can use it and sometimes I can't. And it's okay. I'm okay with that. So I think as medical students, especially at this stage of our training, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to choose the perfect career. But it sounds like to me from what you're saying is it's really a mind, a mindset and a mentality 
and that yeah. you really can love whatever you choose and whatever you end up in. You um, totally can. Uh, you can you can love whatever you end up in. You can be loved by your patients. But most importantly, remember that medicine's only one slice of the pie. The other pie has got to be a uh, relationship to a partner, whatever that is. So spouse, partner, that's important. Relationship to your community. Uh, your own happiness and peace and joy, which is hobbies, um, sports, whatever. Um, there was a beautiful article in the Journal of the American Medical Association that came out about six months ago. It's called The Perfect Specialty. Uh, in the States, uh, internists often play the role of family physicians, uh, uh, like family physicians in Canada, and they're all, also hospitalists. And he tells the story of a woman that comes to his office every week and says she's so short of breath, and he's already taken an adequate history, a full physical, and done a reasonable uh, um, roster of uh, investigations, and they're all negative. She complains she's so, so short of breath. And he takes for her a walk, and she can talk, and her oxygen saturation doesn't fall. She doesn't get cyan on her. Her vital signs don't change. And at the end of the office visit, she says, well, I've had enough of this. I must get off and see my grandchildren. And he talks about the perfect specialty, and he says, I don't know if there is one. You know, uh, in my specialty, we see patients who, have, who think they have uh, 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 diseases, but or they have physical manifestations of a disease, but no specific diagnosis, it eludes them. And they, every, every disease has their Achilles tendon. He thinks maybe the only disease that's perfect, or so only specialty is perfect is nephrology, because <laughs> you can't get to the nephrologist unless you have abnormal kidney function. But everywhere else you can. So the orthopedic surgeons have back pain. The ENT or the otolaryngologists have people with chronic sensation in their throat or dizziness. The ophthalmologists have people that have irritations in their eye and nothing wrong, or f shining lights in their eye, but nothing wrong. Um, the surgeons see patients with abdominal pain with no serious underlying pathology. The gastroenterologists see irritable bowel, and the gynecologists see people with chronic pelvic pain, and so it goes. So maybe there's no perfect, uh, no perfect uh, specialty, but yeah, you need to find your uh, joy in life and uh and 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 comfort zone and I think I finally found mine you know I find my cruising at altitude I'll leave you with uh one other thing so we're in the cardiovascular block here and I don't know if you remember this important study that was started 70 years ago or in 1948 in Framingham which would be considered like uh maybe the Richmond or Abbotsford of Vancouver it's a working class town, um, and they studied uh, these people for cardiovascular disease. They measured their blood pressure, their cholesterol, how much they smoked, their weight, their body mass index, and they were smart enough to bank their blood, and they studied them for decades and decades. First of all, what they found, that there was a link between smoking and lung cancer, and then there was a link between smoking and heart disease, and so it goes. Uh, so people talk about the Framingham study, but an even more interesting study came out and started about the same time. It's called the Harvard Medical School Men's Study. And I apologize for being men, but uh, before the Second World War, Harvard wouldn't let women admit women to their uh, university, to their medical school. It wasn't until after the Second World War. But the Harvard's uh, Men's Study um, uh, hasn't really concluded, but they've reached a milestone. It's still ongoing. But they they published uh, their results on happiness, and what do you think they found? It's what we knew all along: that joy and happiness was not the result of wealth. When you achieved an adequate income, mm. achieve, having more wealth was not positively associated with happiness. Past the, seventy five thousand dollars a year, I think. Yeah, or whatever it is in Vancouver, a billion dollars to live here to rent a friggin' basement suite. <laughs> but once you can rent your basement suite and get your craft dinner, you should be <laughs> happy. Uh, it, it wasn't whether you made a ma monumental discovery, like sequencing a gene or stem cell. It wasn't political power. It wasn't prowess. 
it was only two or three things. Number one, connection to your community, connection to your family, connection to your partner. Those are the only three things that predicted longevity and happiness. You know, so it's a pause. It makes you think. All this fighting and climbing and scraping to get into the medical specialty, for what? For what? I'm pretty sure I can be happy in any specialty. I can now. No, I couldn't before. Do you think that as an ER physician, uh, it takes a certain personality to, to be an ER physician? I've talked to a couple of medical students who say, oh, you need to be really quick on your feet, or oh, they, they look for people who are calmer. Do you think that there's an association between a, a person's personality and a specialty, or do you think that's all false? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is, um, if there's a thing, if there's a personality. Well, there's such a variation, I think, even with our group, you know what I mean? Yeah, some people are laid back, some are super uptight. I think I'm more laid back, maybe I'm more uptight inside, but I laid back on the outside. Uh, yeah, you have to be quick on your feet, but we train for that, right? We practice like sports people do. We practice the plays over and over with simulations where we go over in our mind. Um, I don't think you have to be a particular type. I think the specialty is wide and can can support all people. Is That's there anything sure. about your specialty in particular that you really love that makes you wake up in the morning and you think, oh, I love ER medicine? Well, I think... Um, the thing I like the most, honestly, uh, the, the, well, it's not number one. I'd say number two is the variety of problems. Uh, uh, number three, I love the acuity. But number one is I love the people I work with. Actually, m mostly the nurses and the and the allied staff, the respiratory therapists, the venipuncture, housekeepers. Like, I know them all. I love the team. Yeah, I love the team, and I... And then when we have an acute situation, uh, like we're losing jet power in the air and we're going to lose altitude, I love it when there's a core of us and we can trust each other and, and we can we can work this out and we'll say, okay, who's on the team? Okay, fasten your seatbelts. We're going to do this. And, you know, we have designated jobs and, and we work together. That is the most fun. The second most fun is if I can have a medical student a resident that has a great sense of humor, and then we're going to have a riot. We're absolutely going to have a riot. So, I think it's I think it's the team I like more than anything. Do you think that's possible to create in any specialty? Totally, it totally is. It's the same in obstetrics. It's the same in general surgery. It's got to be the same. It's got to be the same. And it could be the same in family practice too. Um, I've done some work up in the north and I come across some remarkable people, people that are not motivated just by money or prowess and do some really cool things in their their jobs. They want to improve the quality of life um, for communities. And so I find that hugely, hugely um, gratifying and heartwarming, you know, to see people, wow, you, you're carrying the flag. And so they're in small little communities. I'll give you an example. I was doing some little... Um, a teaching thing up in Burns Lake, but also met a doc in Fraser Lake, which is a smaller community. It was, um, uh, both of the communities were sort of um, uh, scorched by the recent forest fires in the summer. Anyways, in Fraser Lake, uh, these physicians said, well, why do our patients need to travel to Prince George a few hundred kilometers to get a stress test? Uh, we should get a, we should get a treadmill and get a, do stress testing in our office. And the health authority said, well, we won't, we won't pay for one. They said, that's okay. The physician says, we'll pool our income. We'll buy our own. Thumbs up to these people, right? Put their own money for the patients. It's phenomenal, right? And so that's really cool to see. You know, they're, they're, those are people, that, you know, dedicated to their job. So, yeah, I, I think you can find dedicated, kind, decent people everywhere. And there are mean people everywhere. We just have to sort of weed them out. <laughs> Or body check them a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to work at a walk-in clinic and make a lot of money, I think you'll have a boring job. Uh, I just think there's lots of opportunity, and uh, there'll be there'll be tons in the future. And we don't know what the future holds. Um, the other thing is, people say you can't change specialties. Uh, it was different in your day. I, I I sort of disagree. I see people changing. 
I see people say, well, you can't get into plastic surgery unless you did a million electives and and you tried to, um, uh, what's the word, um, socialize or whatever it is with the plastic surgeons. And yet, uh, you know, I'm each, every once in a while I run into a plastic surgery resident and I say, how did you get into plastic surgery? Did you do a million electives? No. Did you do a ton of electives here? No. Are your parents plastic surgeons? No. And, and you just talk to them. They're nice people. And they said, we'd like this person in the program. It's true for ophthalmology as well. It's true everywhere. So, yeah, some of those people that are, you know, spend all their energy towards a certain specialty, for sure they'll get in. But there are also people that are are, are taken in by the specialty. They say they, they want that, Tina, because that's a lovely person. We should have that person on our team. And they'll take you. And I... I would, too. If I was picking a team, I'd pick nice people over competent people because people can be trained and learn the information. But niceness, kindness, decency, those are hard traits to train, eh? It's, right? Yeah. Is there anything particular about emergency medicine that you don't like? Yeah, um, what, what is it? Um, yeah, well, so so much of medicine has become uh, this thing about patient-centered care. Um, some people could be sort of cynical, like customer service care. And uh, like I, sometimes I feel uh, like we're the uh, customer returns department at Home Depot. Uh, people come to us with problems that nobody else can solve, and they have um, a pre-scripted or, or preconceived idea about what they need based on information from the internet or what their parents or friends have told them and some people are even on their phone to their friends in Toronto I, I, wait a second I got a a cousin in Toronto is a, is a cardiologist he says I need something about an echocardiogram are you going to give me an echocardiogram I said no I'm going to do a history and physical exam first what do you mean you're not going to give me an echocardiogram Benny he says I should get an echocardiogram wait, wait, wait he's not giving you an echocardiogram so I mean it's really crazy like that mm-hmm. so people uh, yeah, come to you. And, be, and, and and part of that's because there's no trust, right? They they don't know us for very long or they don't trust us for very long. Or so they don't trust us. We have to gain their trust and we have a short period of time to do that. Whereas family physicians or maybe your returning patient to a, a ear, nose, and throat specialist or a general surgeon or gynecologist, maybe that trust is there. But because there's no trust, people come in and sometimes they have a bit of a shopping list. So that's uh, that's one of the the few things I uh, I don't like. So one thing about emergency medicine that I've heard is you really don't get any follow up care, and I hear that that's something you're saying is true right now. Does that affect how you care for your patients at all? Not knowing what happens to them once you've stabilized them and they're out the door. Yeah, I, I, well, we you can follow up on your patients, and now with electronic medical records, we do, and I. I, I actually follow up on a lot of my patients, and a very few of them that I'm concerned about, I have a handful of what I call my special people, actually. I actually contact them and meet them for coffee and phone them up and see how they're doing. And, and I have a hand, I have a little bag full of those people. So actually, interesting and fantastic cases often, we will follow them up. Um, and... Uh, you know, I don't know how much do you want to follow someone with a minor laceration to their finger that I put a Band-Aid on. I I think that's okay. Although there's a few I've put Band-Aids on that are I followed up on because they're sort of interesting. But, yeah, yeah, I think they're the, – and, and then, of course, we have uh, um, our regular patients. We call them the frequent flyers or familiar faces, and we, we get to know those people all the time. And I see them in the hospital and say, how are you doing today? I just saw you yesterday and all that. So that, that's the follow-up there. So you're at St. Paul's. I yeah. know you have a very special patient demographic there. Yeah. Um, a lot of addictions, I'm sure, that you see. Yeah. How do you find that you deal with patients that don't appear to be making any progress? Yeah. So um, I try and take that Hayden Carruth sort of way and let my ego and not have expectations about what they must do and and finger-wagging, and I... First of all, I accept the fact that many of these people come from horrible backgrounds, almost every one of them, because I get to ask many of them their stories, because uh, I see many of them over and over again. It often starts as major childhood trauma and sexual abuse and abandonment and a distrust and a disdain for authority. So, 
you know, if my wife can't get me to change the most basic behavior, like be on time or or finish the chores she's going to do, how can I expect someone that's been battered and beaten and got the short end of the stick? And maybe the genes have been mucked up because of uh, fetal alcohol syndrome or uh, drug addiction of a parent's or drug addiction in utero. So uh, while their behavior may be difficult and challenging, I, I, I don't wag my finger about them and, and try and be more sanctimonious and say, you know, you better do a better, you can do a better job than that. Just, I just try and say, how can I help you on this day? And if this is the best advice and you don't want that, it's okay with me. Like, I don't own you and I don't own this planet. Like, I, this is the best advice. It's okay. So how do you think we can help them more effectively? Do yeah. you think it's prevention, more supports during their wow. growing years? or? Wow, that's a loaded question, <laughs> Tina. Uh, my personal view about the problem of addiction is that we're approaching as if it's a medical problem, and I don't think it's a medical problem. And this is where I would wish I had a background in liberal arts. I think this is a human problem. So whenever you attack a problem from one aspect, from the lens of medicine, if all you have is, is a hammer, every problem is a nail. So for the medical people, this is a problem of chemical imbalance needing to be stabilized by opiate substitutes or take away the craving with Suboxone. But there's way more to it than that. You know, people, not everybody, but like some people get involved and have addictions and have bad outcomes like, like overdose and death and are just experimental users. So, I mean, yes, part of the problem is a contaminated drug supply, uh, but the other problem is, is people that are destroyed and have a vacuum in their heart and soul and all the methadone and suboxone or buprenorphine, naloxone, is Arcadian or dispensing heroin is not going to change that. And so we have to figure out a way to fix that human void. I don't have the answer for that, but I don't think it lies in medicine. And I think if we're really going to make a change here, you would have a discussion and you would have at the table sociologists, philosophers, business people, systems engineers, accountants, psychologists, psychiatrists, physicians, lay public. Then you might get a broader discussion about what the problem is. It's a, it's a complicated problem and there's no solution. No one solution fits all. I know here in Vancouver and well, I guess elsewhere in Canada, part of the problem is a contaminated uh, drug supply, but that's not the only part of the problem. So, What can we do as physician advocates? Yeah, I think we can advocate for the greater well-being of the patients. Uh, you know, so we can we can support them in terms of stable housing. We can support them in connection to community. We can support them in making friendships uh, when they're ready when they're ready uh, to uh, uh, transition away from using drugs and get on substitutes. Then we can direct them to addiction clinics, but not demand or force them to do that. And those that can't, that just can't do it, it's not tolerable for them. Then. We should consider this as palliation and give them drug substitutes and not make such a big political or uh, make such a value statement on that. And I think in Vancouver, people are trying all of those things, but it's a challenging problem, and um, and I don't think that there's going to be an easy solution, and I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. This is just my opinion. I'm not an expert. So we've talked a lot about changes to medical education. I'm curious to know how you got involved with the UBC faculty. Oh, yeah. I, I just love to teach, and I wanted to give it, pay it forward. Uh, I think this uh, profession is a profession of, of um, uh, apprenticeship-like. In fact, that's how medicine used to be. Uh, back in the 1800s, it wasn't you had to pass so many courses and tick off so many boxes. You just hang, hung out with a a senior physician and he or she said that you had the adequate skills and you could get your mitts in somebody's cavity and and do the work. So I think it's important to provide mentorship and apprenticeship and I sort of think that that's people did that to me and I was very grateful and still I get mentored to learn things from 
senior physicians or even physicians younger than me and so I think that's our obligation to give back so I enjoy that and also it's great you're the people are younger they are energetic they push you back they ask well why do you do it that way or why not and I think yeah why do we do it that way maybe it's stupid so that's why I like that and it's different it's different than my clinical work tell us something that surprised you in both your clinical work and as an educator yeah what surprises you? Well, what surprises me in emergency medicine, hardly anything surprised me anymore, except that I was surprised that uh, that I, I'm, I'm ready to be surprised that nobody knows everything. And uh, even the smartest and most astute physicians uh, can either make mistakes or, or be in a corner. Um, what surprises me? I think the, re- the human resilience surprises me and amazes me actually that that's uh what surprises me there was some of the resilience of people so sick you think they'll never survive and and they do and that's that's quite amazing and in medical education the same thing as you think oh boy i don't think this student is going to make it and sure enough that student's got a fellowship in cardiology or something like that and so students can metamorphosize too <laughs> yeah So we're approaching the end of our interview, and I just want to know more about your life outside of medicine. Um, Can you tell us a little bit more about, uh, you kind of mentioned that you have this perspective where you're you're balancing uh, life outside of medicine. Yeah, that only came lately, not at the beginning, unfortunately. Uh, Probably to to the... um, disdain of my family they say that the only people in medicine that will know you work so hard is your family because you won't be there for the (laughs) holidays the birthdays the special occasions um so yeah i do a lot outside of medicine um uh, spend lots of time well my children are grown but spend time with my uh wife and uh one of my uh, daughters that's at home i have hobbies uh we have activities i'm sort of limited on the sports now but when i'm back in action i I have my sort of sports, which is sort of interval training and spin classes. Uh, one of my passions is magic. We've seen you do your magic <laughs> at the coffee house. <laughs> and you'll have a chance to do it again. That's my sort of heroine. My addiction is magic. Um, so I have a community there. I I love to hike. I love to travel to different parts of BC. I love to do locums in small towns to see nice people and nice patients and different people. And so I fill my time up there on the Sunshine Coast, Tofino, northern BC. And then my other hobby is uh, watching bears. Watching, sorry? Watching bears. bears. Oh, watching bears. Okay. Both black bears and grizzly <laughs> bears. So I'm always on the hunt to find out where the bears are, not to shoot them, but actually to just watch them. They're pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> The fur jiggles a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like you've really constructed your life or somehow ended up with a life that allows you to do everything that you want, really. And not entirely, and uh, I think it's it's come that way by by um, a circuitous and bumbling uh, uh, route. But um, I'll leave you with one other thing that I read in the New Yorker this summer. This summer was a gold mine for reading. Um, and uh, this was an article. Uh, um, I actually forgotten this fellow's name, but it's not important. It was an op-ed piece. He wanted to find out what uh, made people happy, uh, very similar to the Harvard men's study. Why could some people just be so joyous, uh, bouncing with a baby in a park, or just fluttering, uh, 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 watching a butterfly flutter, or reading a book? or helping an old person, or embroidering, or doing something simple. He he tried to figure this out, and uh, uh, what he came across is that the the, the people that can find uh, joy in the moment, he thought those well, were the people that were the stumblers in life. They got to where they were, not because of some direct, uh, you know, uh, linear path, because they were so, so, uh, forcefully directed and had a preconceived plan is that they were open to change and were open to reflection and were open to just uh, being happy with what they got. So maybe I'm like uh, 
the stumbler in life. And I, I'm okay with that because I can find happiness in, in simple little things now and I don't have to do phenomenal things to know that I'm alive and happy. I think you're doing a lot of things. <laughs> I think you've overcome a lot of different challenges in life uh, despite what other people may have thought of you or for you. Um, so it just sounds like to me, based on our conversation today, that we really don't need this podcast, do we? <laughs> just to relax into it and see where life takes us. I think so. Yeah, you don't want to be swept away by the current, but you don't want to be fighting upstream. And, you know, if one door closes, another might open, and there might be a good reason for that. And, yeah, I'd, I'd say be adaptable, be flexible, and be open to all possibilities. Thank you very much for your time today, Dr. Finkler, and for coming out here despite your knee. <laughs> My knee will be fine. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, your time. I hope it's worthwhile. I don't think I have any words.